So, Stuart Scott was the first environmentalist stockbroker on Wall Street, and he's also the founder of Transition University. He's also the founder of ex and executive director of United Planet Faith and Science Initiative. Welcome. Welcome. Again, we need to say. Thank you. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Scott. If I may uh, share my screen here. Please do. I, I have a presentation. And let's play. Um, to correct you slightly on your map, uh, I, I have a, a different picture of the globe, and the big red pointer is the east coast of the United States, but I'm actually located in, in Honolulu. My, I call my property a tiny little farm, uh, Honolulu Farms, and there it is. All right. So I'm 12 hours out of sync with you in, in Sweden, and it's uh, <laughs> 4 a.m. where I am. Um, but let's switch back to a, uh, a more traditional view of the uh, uh, the Earth. This is the one that was a gift to humanity from NASA, and I use that as our uh, as a touchstone during my presentation. That's my organization and the uh, logo under which I uh, do all of my my climate and ecological work. And I like to give my email address so people can contact me. And yes, we don't have time, and because of that, let me get right down to the the Arctic methane release, which has also uh, been covered previously by uh, Peter Wadhams, uh, my friend Peter, and, and others. It's the gun going off in the Arctic, as far as I'm concerned, and not a gun in the sense of a race starting, but gun in the sense of the gun that's pointed, we are pointing at ourselves. Um, here's a, a set of polar projections, polar maps. On the left, uh, the state of methane detected over the Arctic in November of 2008 and on the right, November of 2012. You can see a huge difference. This is the Arctic releasing its methane. Um, and this is the Arctic Ocean, uh, more over the ocean than, than over land masses. Uh, and let me refer to uh, one of the three researchers, Dr. Ira Leifert, who you can see here. He's an atmospheric scientist uh, with UC Santa Barbara. And in particular, I like to, uh, I don't like, but I often do quote uh, a quote that he made in 2013. In three parts, I'll give it to you. Some scientists are indicating we should make plans to adapt to a four degree hotter world. That's four centigrade, almost double that in Fahrenheit. In the United States, we measure in Fahrenheit. While prudent, one wonders what portion of the population could adapt to such a world. My view, is that it's just a few thousand people seeking refuge in the Arctic or Antarctica. Now, this is one man's opinion, but a well-informed man uh, at that. So this is a very dire future we're looking at if we don't get it and get it quickly. We don't have time. Now, I want to show four additional maps. This one uh, is the first of a series of four that shows the drought conditions uh, experienced in the uh, first decade of this century. And the next three will show the one-third point, two-third point, and the final decade of the century. Take a look at the scale, uh, dark blueing, much wetter than usual, and uh, red to purple and pink, um, meaning much drier than usual. And the source is the University Corporation of Atmospheric Research, a consortium of, univer of universities in the United States, well-respected. So take a look at the changes. Uh, now, notice also that in the Sahara region, you have yellow and green. That doesn't mean they're wet. It means it was normally dry. Again, this is a relative uh, uh, drought map. Take a look at 2030 through 39 and the drought patterns that are developing. 2060 through 69 and 2090 through 99. So my principal fear is not ocean rise. My principal fear is the ability for humanity to feed itself because a huge swath of the United States, North America, of the Mediterranean, of Southern Africa, of the Amazon, will be very difficult to conduct agriculture. And the places that are still receiving rain are Northern Canada, and Northern Russia, and those traditionally are not agricultural and don't have uh, thick uh, uh, 
topsoil as we do in the mid-latitudes. But going back to 2030 to 39, there's enough damage being done there that we have a serious concern for those alive now. And this is one of the problems is that if we keep saying that this is a problem of 2100, 2200, 1000 years, we're not going to get it. Humanity reacts when it's threatened now, and we are threatened now. We are threatening ourselves now. Again, back to the touchstone, our only home. I want to try to bring us to a realization. I want to go bigger than carbon dioxide as the cause of what's happening. What really is causing this? I like to say that, again, I don't like, but I often say that global situ civilization has an operating system. Few people talk about an operating system for, for civilization, but we do have one and it's seriously flawed. It's dysfunctional, in fact, and it is self-destructive as it's turning out. So what would you call that operating system? Money and economics. But in particular, it's a brand of economics, neoclassical economics, also known as growth economics, also known as mainstream econ economics, because it has supplanted all other economic theories for the past hundred years till it's the only game in town. It dictates what happens when, where, what doesn't happen, who gets elected. Money and economics are in control of humanity. Now, our economic operating system is converting nature into money as quickly as it possibly can. It's turning this into this. Or another way of looking at it, it's turning this, a lush, rich nature, into this. We know it. We get it. That part we get. Well, many of us get. Those who stand to benefit most by the system are perhaps intentionally not getting it. The operating system itself prevents us from confronting or even seeing the problem. Again, this sits above carbon dioxide as, as where the problem is coming from, in my opinion. In nearly every university on earth, mainstream economics teaches that nature is an externality. Incredible, that we don't care about nature in our economic system is unfathomable to me. Globally, money is held to be the highest measure of value. Just take a look at the language, net worth, price, earnings, the bottom line, interest, GDP, all measures of value of the individual, of the corporation, of the, of the country. And of course, bottom line, which is a metaphor for the most important thing, even though it refers to a monetary uh, summation of, of of what it's worth. Arguably, money is the only measure of value in society, and that is the source of our problem. In America, it's just referred to as the almighty dollar. We cut to the chase. Unless we can make a paradigm shift to an economic system that values and assesses ecology and ethical behavior, we ourselves may become a casualty of anthropogenic extinction. So I'm going to go to a solution, even though I'm in the first part of describing, the first section of describing the problem. And this is a proposal. In order to shift the paradigm, I say let's employ civilization's most respected recognition, the Nobel Peace Prize. Let's change this, change money, using this. In particular, I've got a proposal out for a Nobel Peace Prize for sustainable development, but I will say truly sustainable development since the neoclassical economists have tried to co-opt the term sustainable development into sustainable growth, which it is not. That's an oxymoron. The URL for this proposal is np4sd.org, Nobel Prize for Sustainable Development.org. And there are three nominees. One is the Club of Rome, the Club of Rome sponsored the Limits to Growth study, which the former speaker, Dennis Meadows, was one of the, the principal authors of. His wife, Donella Meadows, Jorgen Randers, and William Behrens were all participants in that first study in 1972. And it was updated 30 years later. And it is we are still tracking the predictions made in that original model, very robust model. The second nominee, Dr. Herman Daly, 
Dr. Daly was a World Bank senior economist for eight years until he resigned because the World Bank of that day was not getting it. He's known as the father of ecological economics, which is a viable alternative to the current growth economics, which only focuses on, on money, externalizes ethics and ecology. And a quote from Dr. Daly, there is something fundamentally wrong with treating the earth as if it were a business in liquidation. And the third nominee, Pope Francis, perhaps strange bedfellows, you might say, but not so. Pope Francis caused to be published in 2015 an encyclical, which became world famous, called Praised Be or Laudato Si in the original language of St. Francis, his namesake. And let me give you just one quote from this document. Given the insatiable and irresponsible growth produced over many decades, we need also to think of containing growth by setting some reasonable limits and even retracing our steps before it's too late. This document is very important. And Pope Francis started to use green habit for the clergy, and I call him the green pope. He's not the first clergyman to sound the alarm, but he has sounded it at great risk personally, I believe. And so I believe he's, he is deserving of a shared Nobel Peace Prize for sustainable development. Thank you very much. That's what I have. And here again is my email address for anybody who would like to get in touch with me afterwards. Thank you very you. much. Yes, thank you, Mr. Scott. I know you have some uh, some questions. Yeah, we need, we almost need need to repeat that again. All the, the your keynote presentation that was um, very great, I think. And what do you think it takes for people to understand to really get this? Uh, a scientist once told me it takes a double whammy to understand. You need to have like two big catastrophes which are not linked together to really get it on a personal level. Uh, what, what does it take? I, I would say it takes a shock. It, it takes one or more. It takes repeated shocks. I'm not into sugarcoating this. I used to present to young audiences. I no longer do because I think it's a disservice. Now, I have personally created some problems in my own family. I have two sons who are now in their 20s who grew up with this, and they certainly understand it. Um, but I think for um, mature individuals, teenagers on upward, we need to get them very aware of the future they face, because I believe our hope is with the youth of the planet taking to the streets, has been demonstrated recently with another issue of uh, uh, gun control in the United States and the shootings, the epidemic of shootings in mm -hmm. Parkland. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank, Thank you so much, Mr. Scott. Thank you.